The Big Bow Mystery by Israel Zangwill Read by Adrian Pretzelis This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Big Bow Mystery by Israel Zangwill Chapter 9 For a moment there was an acute, terrible silence. Mortlake's face was that of a corpse. The face of the dead man at his side was flushed with the hues of life. To the overstrung nerves of the onlookers, the brooding eyes of the picture seemed sad and stern with menace, and charged with the lightnings of doom. It was a horrible contrast. For Wimp alone the painted face had fuller, more tragical meanings. The audience seemed turned to stone. They sat or stood in every variety of attitude, frozen, rigid. Arthur Constance's picture dominated the scene, the only living thing in a hall of the dead. But only for a moment. Mortlake shook off the detective's hand. Boys, he cried in accents of infinite indignation, this is a police conspiracy. His words relaxed the tension. The stony figures were agitated. A dull, excited hubbub answered him. The little cobbler darted from behind his pillar and leapt upon a bench. The cords of his brow were swollen with excitement. He seemed a giant overshadowing the hall. Boys, he roared in his best Victoria Park voice, listen to me. This charge is a foul and damnable lie. Bravo! Hear, hear! Hooray! It is! was roared back at him from all parts of the room. Everybody rose and stood in tentative attitudes, excited to the last degree. Boys! Peter roared on. You all know me. I'm a plain man, and I want to know if it's likely a man would murder his best friend. No! in a mighty volume of sound. Wimp had scarcely calculated upon Mortlake's popularity. He stood on the platform, pale and anxious as his prisoner. And if he did, why didn't they prove it the first time? Hear, hear! And if they want to arrest him, why couldn't they leave it till the ceremony was over? Tom Mortlake's not the man to run away. Tom Mortlake! Tom Mortlake! Three cheers for Tom Mortlake. Hip, hip, hooray! Three groans for the police. Hoo, hoo, hoo! Wimp's melodrama was not going well. He felt like the author to whose ears is borne the ominous sibilance of the pit. He almost wished he had not followed the curtain raiser with his own stronger drama. Unconsciously, the police scattered about the hall drew together. The people on the platform knew not what to do. They had all risen and stood in a densely packed mass. Even Mr. Gladstone's speech failed him in circumstances so novel. The groans died away. The cheers for Mortlake rose and swell, and fell and rose again. Sticks and umbrellas were banged and rattled. Handkerchiefs were waved. The thunder deepened. The motley crowd, still surging about the hall, took up the cheers, and for hundreds of yards around people were going black in the face out of mere irresponsible enthusiasm. At last Tom waved his hand. The thunder dwindled, died. The prisoner was master of the situation. Grodman stood on the platform, grasping the back of his chair, a curious, mocking, Mestophilophian glitter about his eyes. His lips wreathed in a half-smile. There was no hurry for him to get Denzil Cantercot arrested now. Wimp had made an egregious, a colossal blunder. In Grodman's heart there was a great, glad calm, as of a man who has strained his sinews to win in a famous match and has heard the judge's word. He almost felt kindly to Denzil now. Tom Mortlake spoke. His face was set and stony. His tall figure was drawn up haughtily to its full height. He pushed the black mane back from his forehead with a characteristic gesture. The fevered audience hung upon his lips. The men at the back leaned eagerly forward. 
The reporters were breathless with fear, lest they should miss a word. What would the great Labour leader have to say at this supreme moment? Mr. Chairman and gentlemen, it is to me a melancholy pleasure to have been honoured with the task of unveiling tonight this portrait of a great benefactor to Bow and a true friend to the labouring classes, except that he honoured me with his friendship while living, and that the aspirations of my life have, in my small and restricted way, been identical with his, there is little reason why this honourable duty should have fallen upon me. Gentlemen, I trust that we shall all find an inspiring influence in the daily vision of the dead, who yet liveth in our hearts and in this noble work of art, wrought, as Mr. Gladstone has told us, by the hand of one who loved him. The speaker paused a moment, his low, vibrant tones faltering into silence. If we humble working men of Bow can never hope to exert individually a tithe of the beneficial influence wielded by Arthur Constant, it is yet possible for each of us to walk in the light he has kindled in our midst, a perpetual lamp of self-sacrifice and brotherhood. That was all. The room rang with cheers. Tom Mortlake resumed his seat. To Wimp, the man's audacity verged on the sublime, to Denzil on the beautiful. Again there was a breathless hush. Mr. Gladstone's mobile face was working with excitement. No such extraordinary scene had occurred in the whole of his extraordinary experience. He seemed about to rise. The cheering subsided to a painful stillness. Wimp cut the situation by laying his hand again upon Tom's shoulder. "'Come quietly with me,' he said. The words were almost a whisper, but in the supreme silence they travelled to the ends of the hall. "'Don't you go, Tom!' the trumpet tones were Peter's. The call thrilled an answering chord of defiance in every breast, and a low, ominous murmur swept through the hall. Tom rose and there was silence again. "'Boys,' he said, "'let me go. Don't make any noise about it. I shall be with you again tomorrow.' But the blood of the Breaker Day boys was at fever heat. A hurtling mass of men struggled confusedly from their seats. In a moment all was chaos. Tom did not move. Half a dozen men, headed by Peter, scaled the platform. Wimp was thrown to one side, and the invaders formed a ring round Tom's chair. The platform people scampered like mice from the centre. Some huddled together in the corners, others slipped out at the rear. The committee congratulated themselves on having had the self-denial to exclude ladies. Mr. Gladstone's satellites hurried the old man off and into his carriage, though the fight promised to become Homeric. Grodman stood at the side of the platform, secretly more amused than ever, concerning himself no more with Denzel Cantercot, who was already strengthening his nerves at the bar upstairs. The police about the hall blew their whistles, and policemen came rushing in from outside and the neighbourhood. An Irish MP on the platform was waving his gingham like a shillelagh in sheer excitement, forgetting his new-found respectability and dreaming himself back at Donnybrook Fair. Him, a conscientious constable, floored with a truncheon. But a shower of fists fell upon the zealot's face, and he tottered back bleeding. Then the storm broke in all its fury. The upper air was black with staves, sticks and umbrellas, mingled with the pallid hailstones of knobby fists. Yells and groans and hoots and battle cries blent in grotesque chorus like one of Dvorak's weird diabolical movements. Mortlake stood impassive, with arms folded, making no further effort, and the battle raged round him as the water swirls round some steadfast rock. A posse of police from the back fought their way steadily towards him and charged up the height of the platform steps only to be sent tumbling backwards as their leader was hurled at them like a battering ram. Upon the top of the heap he fell, surmounting the strata of policemen, but others clambered upon them, escalating the platform. A moment more and Mortlake would have been taken. Then the miracle happened. 
as when of old a reputable goddess ex machina saw her favorite hero in dire peril straightway she drew down a cloud from the celestial stores of jupiter and enveloped her fondling in kindly night so that his adversary strove with the darkness so did crowl the cunning cobbler the much daring assay to ensure his friend's safety he turned off the gas at the meter an arctic night unprecedented by twilight fell and there dawned the sabbath of the witches the darkness could be felt and it left blood and bruises behind it when the lights were turned on again mortlake was gone but several of the rioters were arrested triumphantly and through all and over all the face of the dead man who had sought to bring peace on earth brooded Crowl sat meekly eating his supper of bread and cheese, with his head bandaged, while Denzil Canticott told him the story of how he had rescued Tom Mortlake. He had been among the first to scale the height, and had never budged from Tom's side or from the forefront of the battle till he had seen him safely outside and into a by-street. "'I'm so glad you saw that he got away safely,' said Crowl. "'I wasn't quite sure he would.' "'Yes, but I wish some cowardly fool hadn't turned off the gas. "'I like men to see that they are beaten.' "'But it seemed easier,' faltered Crowl. "'Easier,' echoed Denzil, taking a deep draught of bitter. "'Really, Peter, I'm sorry to find you always will take such low views. "'It may be easier, but it's shabby. "'It shocks one's sense of the beautiful.' Crowl ate his bread and cheese shamefacedly. "'But what was the use of breaking your head to save him?' said Mrs. Crowl, with an unconscious pun. "'He must be caught.' "'Oh, I don't see how the useful does come in now,' said Peter, thoughtfully. "'But I didn't think of that at the time.' He swallowed his water quickly, and it went down the wrong way and added to his confusion. It also began to dawn upon him that he might be called to account. Let it be said at once that he wasn't. He had taken too prominent a part. Meanwhile, Mrs. Wimp was bathing Mr. Wimp's eye and rubbing him generally with arnica. Wimp's melodrama had been, indeed, a sight for the gods. Only virtue was vanquished and vice triumphant. The villain had escaped and without striking a blow. End of chapter 9